Mal? We are live. Hey, fantastic. Come on, let's do this thing. So, <laughs> just to introduce myself to everyone that's streaming in uh, live today. My name is Tim Rustin. I'm from Coach House Pianos. And joining me is none other than the Mal Poe. Do I call you Mal? Malwin? Well, it's a strange one, really, because I've been Malpope for a long time. The, uh, the reason I became Malpope was that my real name is Maldwin. It's not Malcolm, it's Maldwin. And for the first sort of 20 years of my life, I had to spell it every day. And I went to the <laughs> and not my mates could get it. Uh, and so I, I went with the flow. Uh, but I thought, as I've come up with a new album, and I'm trying to go back to to my roots, to my Maldwin roots, you know, the, the the kid that I was when I started playing the piano and just writing songs, I thought, maybe this is the time to take my name back, you know, become, yes. because the difference, you see, a Malpope, in my mind, means a bad Pope, Malpope, um, but Maldwin means both <laughs> friend, uh, so I'm an old friend who's, a, who's got a father I was, figure. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I've, I've always known you as, always known you as Mal, I noticed on the, the, the album, um, which, it, obviously, you've got Maldwin on there, so t tell us about the album, what, what have you been up to, Mal? So, uh, so this is my this is my studio. This is my uh, my home studio. So that's all my gear in the background. That's my that's my computer. I've got a, a C7 all lined up. Brilliant. It's a sample. It's not a real one at the moment. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is where I where I live and where I've lived really for the last I don't know maybe last six months. Uh, I had a big project on last summer in, in a theatre in Swansea, and after that, I'm th it's always difficult. You know, when you put so much energy into one thing, uh, you need an, another project to go straight to. Otherwise, you get post to a blues. It, it's a really Absolutely. fun. It's a funny experience. You know, when you, how do you how do you go? Anyway, so I came into my into my shed into my studio, and I just started started writing songs. And I started off, if I'm honest, I started off with all the loops and all the stuff that the computer gives you. Uh, and then I, I realized that I'm not as good as Mark Ronson, or any of the kids who do it these days. And so I thought, well, I'll go back to being Maldwin. I'll go back to, you know, just sitting at the piano and, you know, just just, just picking up the tunes. And, it, and it's really weird, you know, if you set yourself a task of writing every day, uh, it, not every day will be a good song, but at the end of a week, you'll have seven songs. And maybe one of them might have something to them. And it was, it was strange. And I'd sort of, it, it, things like this now. So uh, the first single off the album, which has been out for a while, is called uh, Looking for Love. And it was, I was just at this piano went. Okay, so, uh, hmm. all right. What does that what does that lead to? You know, so it's like, um, and, and I mean, I always say tell a story about Paul McCartney when he wrote uh, Yesterday. When he wrote it first of all, you, you, when you're writing a song, quite often you'll be playing playing along, and then you'll sing whatever comes into your head. And for the first couple of days, Yesterday was known as Scrambled Eggs. Was it Scrambled Eggs? But I, the the first words I sang when I came up with this little you know little ditty was, You say I'm crazy. You could be right. And that was it. That, that's all I had for ages. So then I go, I go. And for a long time, I didn't have any more words than you say I'm crazy, you could be right. So it, I then had to sit down and chisel out the words. But the music seemed to come very, 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 very quickly. Yeah, so, so, so to, to, tell us about, about, so do you put your, is it very much a matter of sitting in front of the, the keyboard and improvising? Do you, when you're listening to songs, is there that kind of lines that you pick out and try, to, and, try and kind of um, fit words to? Or is it very much a matter of inspiration when you're in front of the piano and you, and, and you just play? Tell us about that kind of the journey of actually creating and improvising. Yeah. Um, so you have to do it a lot, you know, and it's a, it's a bit like a muscle. The more you do it, the more you get used to how, how your muscles yeah, work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and quite a lot of it, I'd go, um, this is another one, it went. So I thought it's, it's, it's actually quite an odd sort of combination of chords. Uh, and I, I just went, house keys and makeup, coffee to go, keeping your head down. And it's really strange because then you go you know, the mm, 
time. Okay, so there's a verse and there's a chorus going on there. And then it's got, well, what did I sing at the beginning? House keys and makeup, coffee to go. So I, I, I straight away you can see there's some, some sort of story there. I have no idea what it is. And actually, I started thinking about my, my daughter who lives in, in London, in Ealing. She's in lockdown at the moment. And, and you know, for, for maybe a young woman who is living in, in a big city like London, whose life doesn't quite work out as it should. Well, actually, her, hers is terrific. I'm not, I'm, and I've apologized to her if she thought I was thinking anything differently. But it's, you know, it's like, um, you know, you, you had your dreams to change the world, but then you found, found the world was changing you. The weekend comes and goes and you're still tired. It's like you're no, 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 no. And that, I'd be doing that. I'd be saying some of the words getting closer and closer. House keys and makeup, coffee to go, keeping your head down, looking at no one on with the show. So it's a, it's a really, writers sometimes say they start writing something and the characters develop. Uh, and I've done, in my past, I've done quite a lot of musicals. And yes. it, it, it's, it's been true, you know, you find out that suddenly, you know, you have a moment you sit in front of the computer and you find out, I didn't know that person had done that, or that person is going to do that. Um, and you sort of learn about it. And it's been the same with these with these songs. I mean, this is um, now this is an odd sort of. It's nice and sort of like you know, okay. Mm, I wanna be a butterfly. 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 I, I, you know, repeating the same thing four times in a row is a bit daft. But actually, when I started investigating what I was, what I was thinking maybe inside without actually, you know, it's almost like a subconscious thing that happens. And I was, you know, I'm at an age now where a lot of people are winding down. They're looking towards finishing work and their pensions and all that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm not. And, and I thought that's what butterflies normally do. Butterflies, you know, that you spend a long time in a cocoon and then you, then you, you go through the, the whole thing and then suddenly you have yeah. to have to fly. And I, I thought maybe that's a, a good metaphor for, you know, you're looking at the downtime. I'm looking at the reason. And the, the verses are actually talking to myself, which is the first sign of madness. I want to be a butterfly. I want to be a butterfly. And so it, it, the story is almost there before you'd know it. Something must be going on right. that, um, and you have to tap into that. And, you know, I've been writing songs. I mean, the first song I wrote, I was, I was nine years old. And, and so I've been doing it a long time. I mean, I don't know if there are any better than they used to be when I was nine, but at least I know more about the structure and about the, the craftsmanship of, of becoming a songwriter. And, um, and do, do, do you find that a lot of your songs now are actually... Um, maybe built around the themes, and you kind of take inspiration from your your your, your history. Oh yeah, long yeah. history as a musician. <laughs> long, 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 long history. And growing up, you know, as as a as a human being, you know, I mean, you know, the, uh, I wrote on a guitar. And the first song I ever wrote was "There's a boy all alone for the rest of his days, for no one but this little boy." ever will play and his eyes glint like diamonds his face was wet and gay but now with this little boy no one will play well it, you know it's it's simple it's straightforward and, and actually i did have a lot of friends but um it it, it it was something that seemed very natural then i come from a family of of music my grandmother was a fantastic piano player um, more so than we gave her credit for at the time. She grew up, well, she was born in 1900, but her father was a, uh, used to conduct a choir in, in the local chapel in New, si in New Silo, in, in Landau, in Swansea. And they, there was music, I mean, really serious music. She had all these letters cool. after her name for a little lady, four foot tall, five foot wide, who, who never lived further away from her house than, than a mile from how she was born, but she could play the piano. And so that was always in the, in the, in the air. And um, I said, was I must have, must have caught it, must have caught it.
sorry, how is muted again. Um, I remember but the last time we spoke, you told us about some of your experiences uh, as a nine-year-old or as a musician growing up, and you were incredibly talented as a as a child, obviously, and you got recognised at a young age. Tell t tell the audience um, a bit about your your experience growing up uh, and getting recognised. Your London adventures. London adventures. Yeah, no, I was uh, I was very very fortunate. I must have been a very pushy kid. Uh, and you know, sometimes you've got to push, you know, because most doors don't, most doors don't open very easily. Sometimes they do, and it's magic when that happens. But most of them don't. And so I, I, I started started writing songs when I was nine. And um, I, I used to sing at the after church services. We used to go back to somebody's house, a guy called Mike Nicholson in Treboth in Swansea. And they'd always say, "Oh, come on, get your guitar." Out. So they put this little kid on a chair in the middle of the room, and I'd play my latest songs. And after a while, uh, Mike Nicholson said, uh, you should send these to John Peel on Radio 1. And I must admit, I'd never heard of John Peel at that stage because it was past my bedtime. It was a 10 o'clock show. Uh, so I did it. I'd already sent tapes to Opportunity Knox, to Cliff Richards. Uh, I'd had an Opportunity Knox audition. I'd been turned down by HTV Wales. They told me to go and get guitar lessons. But I kept, kept pushing. And maybe that's... Someone said to me once that the thing I really like about you, and I thought it was going to be my my voice, my songwriting, the piano playing, said you never gave up. And I suppose that's possibly one of the, the one of the lessons every musician and every songwriter should learn is never to give up. Um, and so I just kept on sending tapes, and I I, I recorded it on my dad's Philips tape recorder. Uh, I sent it off without really telling anybody in the family, and then. I, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, I got a letter back. Well, actually, it was a t to me, but addressed to my mum and dad. They wanted uh, my parents to call them to allow me to go and do a recording session for Radio 1. And then six oh, weeks later, um, Elton John rang the house, and my, my life changed forever. I mean, it changed when the John Peel session happened, really. And there's a, there is a lovely picture. And so you know, certain pianos have been landmarks in my life uh, because I'd, I'd grown up in a, in a house with a really old upright piano and I'd, I'd learned to play my songs or write my songs but I went to, went to London and I went to Egton House and the first you know the piano that they had there was a, was a grand piano, it was a Steinway grand piano, I was, I was 13 years old and for the first time in my life I had this amazing grand piano and the funny thing is for all the publicity of those Radio 1 days there's a picture of me sat at the piano and john peel stood behind me reading my lyrics and the song i was going to play was this one it goes play it. I mean, I still can't play it properly now, even though 40 years later, wherever it is. Uh, and so I never actually performed that song on that radio program. But that grand piano made such a big impact on me. And I'm fair play to my parents. I mean, my parents are both school teachers, big, heavily involved in the church. So for me to get wrapped up in a rock and roll lifestyle was, for, you know, it, it should, should have been worrying. Uh, but Rocket, the people at Rocket were fantastic. Elton was, was terrific with me. Um, but they went and bought a piano without telling me. It was a really lovely surprise coming home from school. And they bought a night piano. I'm not, do you do night pianos? Have I mean, you ever come across we, them? We, we still do night pianos. Some of the, some of the trusty old nights. Um, we, still, we, still, we, still, we still got some of them. Customers, when they part exchange them, um, we still got a few of them in our warehouse. Tell, it, tell us about that. Tell us about that first piano because I, I bet you, when you sit in the piano, you can probably still remember images of that um, that old night. I remember Elton John himself and the, the Christmas advert from John Lewis had a picture of him sitting down in front of his, his little old piano. Yeah, I, well, I, he can still, still. Yeah, yeah go on. Well, I actually learned a little bit later after my parents had bought this night piano that the first album uh, Elton had made called Empty Sky he'd recorded on a night piano. Um, in fact, we're still in the family. My parents are both in care now, but the, the, the piano is still in the, their family home. So I've still got a, an eye on it. But I, the thing is, I, I've got no space to, to put it anywhere. But yeah, it was just such a, it was such a bright piano. It was so, compared with the old battered one that we used to have and, and played on, suddenly this was sparkling. It was almost like having a grand, you know, in our, in our sort of, a, a, a sort of like lounge, you know, and it was yeah. fantastic. And that led to writing so, so many songs. Um, you know, this is, so this is one. So the next piano in my history is a piano that you've got. 
I, I've actually seen this piano in your. Have in you your sold it? Yes, it's, I, I hope you haven't sold it. Uh, the Stein, it's a Stein Ooh. from Abbey Road. Have you still got uh, it? Absolutely, we still, we still got it. It's a um, it's very much a, a treasured uh, piece that uh, one, of, one of our collector's items. In fact, um, it's it's on view in our workshop. Um, we still got it. It's probably waiting for another another visit from you, Mal, before oh, yeah. we, we let some before we let someone play it again. Well, yeah, if we <laughs> some pictures of it afterwards because it is it's a wonderful well everybody would have played that piano everybody who went through yeah. Abbey Road so you can think of all the magic records that were made uh, during we, the seventies and whatever it was absolutely we're we're building out a um a documentary actually um on it to put something together to actually share with everybody uh, share with our audience um, because it truly is a magical piece. And not yeah. just for not 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 just for for what the instrument is in itself, but for the history that's behind it, and the people that have played it. It's and as you as as you say, like yourself, how old would you have been when you when you came in came in contact with the piano at Abbey Road? So I was I think I was sixteen years old. Um, okay. Elton John had just done a coast to coast tour of America, but he had committed to producing my next record. So uh, he got me tickets to see the. So make sure it's the right year. It's it's Liverpool versus Manchester United final. He got me tickets to the FA Cup final because we both love football. And then I went back to stay at the house and uh, I sat at his Steinway Grand Piano. Well, that's another one actually. If you look at the Greatest Hits album, uh, there's a picture of Elton sat at his piano. And so that used to be in Virginia Water. That picture was. And I stayed there as well and played that piano then. But that piano he bought it for Freddie Mercury. Uh, it was Freddie Mercury, I know, and he, he, Freddie wanted to sell it, so Elton bought that one. So the weekend of the FA Cup final, finished the FA Cup, uh, Manchester United won, uh, Stuart Pearson scored a goal, I think, to win the game. Great goal from uh, Jimmy Case, a volley. Anyway, I digress. Went to State Allen's house in Windsor, and we went through the tracks uh, on the piano, on his piano. And then the following weeks, so I went back then, back and went to school for the week, caught the train up on a Friday morning it must have been and went straight to abbey road so i walk into abbey road uh, it's, it's a friday afternoon the session's going to start in the evening and i walk in and there are three people sat at your piano uh, elton john is one of them guy next to him is brian moore he's to present on the ball and the next guy is is eric morgan from Morecambe and wise who yeah. were the biggest stars in you know in british television at that time and so uh, uh Elton says to Eric, uh, this is, he used to call me Maldwin. Maybe that's another reason why I've, I've changed my name. Maldwin. So Eric, this is Maldwin. And uh, Eric Morkham said, uh, so where are you from, boy? And I said, I'm, I'm from Swansea. He said, oh, me and Ernie did our first gig at the Empire in Swansea. So I'll never forget that. But that evening, when the studio filled up with all the other musicians, uh, I'm playing the piano. They want. They always wanted me to be a musician as well as being a singer. So it didn't appear to be like a teeny bop created thing. So the song uh, was. Uh Would you cry if I went away? Would you break down and beg me to stay? I would for you I would for you That's the verse And so as we were playing with all these Magnificent musicians Ray Cooper from Elton's band was the percussionist and I mean they were wonderful But if I was playing and singing At the same time It was obviously it, it, There wasn't enough control between Going onto the piano microphones And so Elton said Oh well look you just concentrate on playing the piano, and I'll sing it. Wow. So, for this whole session, I'm going... <laughs> listening to Elton John sing, Big it all inside I just have to say about the way I feel No, it hurts my pride Can't stop thinking about you I just don't want to go on living without you So um, it was just that that piano moment, and that piano was just I can I can I can feel it now. I can you know, I'm back in that room in Abbey Road. I know exactly how it felt and how wonderful it was. So you must get that piano up and running. Be great if everybody got a chance to play it somewhere. We will do. 
and I'll let you know when it's uh, when it's set up here. Terrific, terrific. Yeah, so I, what I thought with this new album was to actually go back to those to those roots because there's no point in me pretending to be. Yeah, I mean Mark Ronson. I actually saw Mark Ronson um, a documentary on on the BBC, and I thought, uh, I, it, I know I'm never going to learn. He's been doing this for 30 years since he was a kid. So why don't I go back to my sort of Elton John piano playing roots, really? And so I just I wrote about 20, maybe 30 songs, and then uh, whittled them down to to about 10, 12, 13, 14, and then just started working with them with another. Um, customer of yours, a guy called Andrew Griffiths. Uh, and Andrew has got a piece of magic supplied by Coach House Pianos. Absolutely. Please tell, tell them about it, Mal. So it's a magic piano. It really is a magic piano. It's a C3. Now, is it called a clavier? X, what is it's it? Disclavia. 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 That's it. So it's a proper um, C3 Yamaha piano, but you can play it via MIDI. So obviously, whilst I would love to have uh, a Yamaha or a Steinway or a Busendorfer in my little shed, this enough room. So whilst I can one get day. one day, now <laughs> we're going to shed. <laughs> so I can get pretty close with the samples we've got these days. You know, these, the, the, this this is actually if you can see on the screen. That's that's my C7. I've got a Busendorfer and I've got a, a Steinway uh, as well, and they all sound. They all sound like it, Tim, until you play a real one. No, uh, quite, but but it, it's it's so the audience know it's, it's actual samples taken from a real piano. Yes, you know, yes. That's, how, that's how it works. You know, you can hear the you can hear the, and if you play if you play it, so they're all different recordings of of a note played at different volumes. And so, yeah, and it feels like, you know, I'm playing the piano, you know, and I feel like I've got a, a grand piano. But with the new album, I really wanted to try and go old school, which included going to Prague. Maybe we'll come to Prague in a minute to record the orchestra. Um, but Andrew's been a friend of mine, actually, well, he, he was 17 when he came to work, work experience with me in, in my studio before the war. And so we've done lots of TV programs together, and he, he's carved out this whole career um, doing production music, uh, which involves orchestras. And I thought it would be nice because when Elton John was, was he produced by a guy called Gus Dudgeon and Gus was my producer when I was about 15 years old. And we did a lot of recordings with Gus Dudgeon with, again, I mean, <laughs> you know, the, if you look at my CV, the only person you won't, won't have heard of is me. I mean, Gus, oh, it's 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 wow. yeah, well, you know, we recorded all over the place and Gus was the most successful producer in the world at that stage. He was, you know, he just done, uh, Goodbye Elbic Road, Caribou, Blue Moves, all, you know, he, he, he produced um, the early David Bowie records. Uh, and he had a wealth of experience. And what I've, what I've found is, you know, sometimes you ask questions, sometimes you just absorb what's going on. And what a, what a masterclass I used to have. I, I mean, sometimes when, when I was that age, I didn't appreciate it. Uh, for example, uh, I was we, we were doing sessions. It was in my school holiday, so we didn't, my parents were teachers, so I didn't take a lot of time off school. But I remember being there on uh, one day. We'd, be, we'd been recording all day my record, and they had these special tapes flown in from New York, which arrived sort of mid to late evening. Uh, and it was recordings of Elton John with John Lennon at Madison wow. Square Garden. And so... <laughs> so I'm. It's like ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. We've been up. For, uh, I mean, I'm, you know. So I'm on. The, I'm asleep on the sofa, whilst Gus Dudgeon is mixing. <laughs> she was just seventeen with Elton John and uh, and uh, John Lennon from Madison Square. Right. So I, I'm sure all of that. And I and I really want to try and capture that in this new album, which is called Butterfly. Uh, and so I thought, right, let me just hand the songs over to a, an arranger, because Elton with Gus Dudgeon, they had a guy called Paul Buckmaster, who was an amazing uh, string arranger. Uh, and I, I said to Andrew Griffiths in Estragon Mice, have a listen to some of these old Elton John albums, like Madman Across the Water, where the string arrangements are really, really important. And can you give it a bit of a go? I think is what I said. What I said. Well, he did, and and so what he would do is very similar to what I would do. I would so I I get the piano sample. That sounds like a 
it sounds like a piano. Then Andrew's got string samples, and they sound like an orchestra. He plays brass, but he would send me these arrangements back, and I would just sit at the computer and laugh because they were so completely over the top. Uh, uh, but, but they brought a character to it that's, that's uniform throughout the, the album. And, of course, then you have the discussion, shall we, um, the string samples sound great, the piano sounds great. Well, actually, let's do the piano again because Andrew's got a this this uh, it clavier. What, what, no, what's it called again? This clavier. This clavier. This C three. Um, so I sent him my MIDI files of me playing the piano parts. So it's me playing the piano, but he puts it through his system, and we record a real grand piano. So that sounds great. That's starting to sound real. Then I get the bass player friend in uh, a wall who lives in Garment. We go up to his place. He plays real bass. Tim in Clanetli, he plays real guitars. Uh, Ryan actually came to us to get nice and we recorded real drums. Uh, Andrew's done real, real brass. Nigel Hopkins has done real roads. Well, the only thing left now is the orchestra, is the string section. So, And Andrew had been out to Prague quite a few times with the um, city of Prague philharmonic orchestra and he said we should you know what if we could get out there and record these strings it would make a heck of a difference and it's like ah yeah 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 you know so i spent the kids inheritance <laughs> so <laughs> there's nothing left for them anymore and we went to prague for for a week and and recorded worth it though worth it though well, yeah. do you know what again you know the difference between this sample and a real c3 is so enormous and the difference between the strings and, you know, 20, 20, 30 people all in a room playing together. And they were amazing because, you know, the people in Prague, there's four uh, symphony orchestras, philharmonic orchestras in Prague. So you get a choice of all these great musicians. Um, it's great studio. Schmecky studio is, is the studio we recorded at. They do film scores. They do albums, uh, production albums. You know, people have been there that is, uh, Morricone has been there. Uh, Tom Cruise, pictures on the wall of Tom Cruise when he was there in Prague, uh, recorded oh. studio. Um, so they've got a, a great setup. They know exactly what they're doing. I'd, I'd love to have done it in Wales, if I'm honest, but the infrastructure wasn't quite there for me to do it uh, this time, but maybe next time. Um, yeah. And it was just, I, I mean, you know, I'm quite an emotional sort of character anyway. Uh, I just found myself in tears listening to these these string players because um, quite a lot of the songs are, uh, are you know like this um, um, uh, I've just been a grandfather so it's a uh, writing this was harder than it seems sometimes words just can't express it all Many years will pass before you know All you had to do was call But I would catch you if you should fall And then the strings came in and I was I was blubbering in the back of the of the, the control room just thinking about my granddaughter thinking about the whole experience and and you know I've I've only been lucky enough to be with a a full orchestra and I don't know maybe a dozen times to 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 enjoy that and and there's nothing quite like it there's nothing it's like standing in front of a male voice choir you know you can hear them on record in front of a body of men singing like that it, there is nothing like it and a, no. and a big orchestra ah oh, it's uh, even a, even even the recording of them videos they don't do it justice really. just, no the I, atmosphere yeah and sitting in the room uh exactly. with them as well it was just i mean for them you have to realize it's just a day job you know, so they'd come in with a flask yeah. of coffee, sandwiches, you know, looking at the club. You know, just another day. Yeah, and, and, and you, know, saying, well, you know, do you rehearse with them for a couple of days? No. You give them the music. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, they play it. Uh, they play it. And the first time they play it is usually pretty good. Maybe the second time is better. Third time is fine. So we just how, do how many times do you do it? How many times do you do that? Four times, five times. Maybe pick out a little bit that's wrong, just to sort of like get it, get it spot on right. Wow. But, so the other confession I need to, to make, Tim, is that Go on. I don't read music. So okay. Um, so I don't. I, I mean, you know. So we right. we score. I, I, I never knew that. So. There's hope for each of us that can't read music then. 
Well, yeah, my grandmother always said you'll regret it one day, and she was probably right, you know. But actually, you know, the, I, I don't know how the magic works. I just know it's magic. Um, it, I, always, I always say it's a bit like I know I've got a spleen and a gallbladder. Um, I know they do fantastic things. I don't want to, you know, put it apart. And because for me, it's more, you know, why do, you know, um, this was, this, this was, I'm looking for something I'm looking for something out there There's got to be someone There's got to be someone who cares yeah, I don't know which way I'm going to light your fire but down that road, I need somebody to care But if you don't know me Then you don't know nothing about me Down in the city Nobody really cares Uptown, downtown, looking for a tune and and those chords, I mean, um, I know the I know the structure of the chords. That's a D and that's a that's a C and that's you know. But I I I don't know their proper relationship. And maybe if I did, I'd be better. Maybe if I did, I'd be worse. I don't know. It's probably too late now, Tim, isn't it? Too late. No, I mean, it's never too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, it's 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 a it's a joy. A piano is a is a is a gift of beauty for life. I would, I would say, um, you know, the only thing I, w I always think about is that, you know, sometimes when you, you know, it's a bit like that thing with the, uh, I'm not sure, the Blues Brothers, when they, um, it, when the nun comes around, they say something bad and they wrap them on the knuckles and then they say something worse and then wrap them again. You know, that, that approach to piano lessons and piano playing, I often find sad. I know a lot of people who have exams and can play, but, but don't. Um, <laughs> You know, because they've been, and it's, it should be fun. You know, it should we be. We see it often. We see it often. And, you know, it's, it's, if you can inspire someone, if you can inspire, if you see someone's got a gift, and you can inspire them um, to to put their all into it or take it up. You know, often it's not a, it's for, for young children, especially when we see see young children come in and they've got incredible talent. Um, and often, it's it's the parents or it's the, the the instrument that they're playing on that is restricting them there's nothing other than that they have the desire to do well um so if, if, if we can actually help someone to, to to progress and you know if we can give them that inspiration by providing them with a, with a quality instrument at a price that that works for them then we will do that um and to see that to see the progression in that in that child or that student or you know, young adults or even, you know, people like yourself, Mal, we, we still get customers in their latter life that are picking up the piano again. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, in, it's inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's very true. It's, it's, it's about, you know, how, how do we provide inspiration for, for others learning? Um, and I think the, the biggest thing is you, you've got to stick at it, haven't you? And, it's, and I, know, I know what you're saying, obviously, from you had a, an inner... Kind of musician that you had to release um and maybe that isn't through you know going through lessons some people prefer the the routine the discipline of lessons uh my younger brother dan you've met dan a few times and he is very much a, a play by ear and we had a job um he's a year below me we had a job we went through lessons together he hated it and yet he you know he flew through to grade eight by the time i was doing grade three right the difference is that he got out of the piano what I, I, I couldn't get out of it. Um, so, you know, everyone's different, aren't they? It, it is. Um, it's, trying, it's, you know, it's always about encouragement, I think, with, with any, you know, not just piano playing or music. It is about encouragement. It's, it's really easy to destroy somebody with the wrong wrong word. I, I had amazing encouragement from, from family and friends. Uh, from, you know, if Elton John says, good words about your piano playing and your songwriting it, it does tend to you know make you feel very good about it so, um, I've always tried to, to be that 
for other musicians to, to give them, you know, give them an opportunity and stuff. No, it, it is fantastic. And you know, the, you know, it, there are different pianos at different stages in your life, aren't there? You know, like that old beaten up piano, the night piano, the sample piano. You know, I, I got a um, a Yamaha Clavinova from from the coach house, which which I use in certain circles. It looks great. Uh, it doesn't need to be tuned. You know, you can plug it into a PA system. You don't have to worry about feedback. So sometimes it's just knowing horses for courses, you know, but if I had the chance to play this or that or one of your Bosendorfers in your showroom, I know which one I would go for. Uh, but sometimes you don't have that opportunity, do you? So it's just, no. it's, it's, it's just great to have the, you know, the different stages. But just play, just play, you know, yeah. for your enjoyment as well. Exactly. Well... I don't have anything else to say, Mal. It's been it's been my pleasure having you on. Um, this is the first time that we've we've done anything like this, and there will be some refinement needed, I guarantee. Um, <laughs> but it's really, really good. Maybe you could just give one parting one play part or piece just before we disappear. Uh, right, let's have a little think. Um, I, no, then I I remember. I, so this is an older song. Um, again, so. Sort of, moments that you remember so I'd, uh, I'd written this and sent it to a couple of different people and in the end Cliff Richard ended up singing it and in those days you didn't have the internet so you couldn't just send an mp3 so the publisher called me up and he said are you sitting down I said yes and he, uh, he said have a little listen to this and it was Cliff Richard singing down the telephone to me I never thought they could be so much more when I was living down in Egypt Never opened up and at the door You really showed me just how much you thought my heart meant But I tried to walk away Into the world of mess Now who would have guessed I hear you calling my name for a reunion Calling my name for a reunion Thought I'd wander too far away Now I've got a brand new start Reunion Reunion of the heart Hey, magic moments you never forget Good. It's been have a good day. Really appreciate it, Mal, and yourself. Take care. Thank Take you. Bye bye. See you all soon.